Several top U.S. banks, due to report earnings, they're stuck with about $40 billion of risky debt on their books that were underwritten in the cheap money era, and that's interrupting the decades-long M&A machine that's enriched bankers and private equity executives over the past decade. Bloomberg corporate debt reporter Paula Selixson joins us now to discuss, and let's start with the headline on this big tape. Wall Street's lucrative leverage debt machine is breaking down. How did we get there? Why are we breaking down? That's a great question. It can be summed up with volatility and rising rates. Essentially, banks provide bridge loans, which are meant to be a temporary form of financing. They never intend to lend that money to these companies for these acquisitions. They intend to sell it to junk bond and leverage loan investors. But with all the volatility, that got harder. As rates rose, that became more expensive. And the banks promised maximum interest rate levels. Mm -hmm. And they have to eat the difference now that the cost of borrowing is higher. And there were some uh, great anecdotes in that story, including, I, I think it was a uh, one particular bank that was approached with a $5 billion deal, and they were like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. I, I am curious, though. I mean, we saw this coming. There was a lot of talk about this all last year. The question is, is it temporary? Or, I mean, obviously, it's going to be temporary at some point, but how long does this last? I think it will last at least a year to two years, depending on how things unfold. Mm. It just also depends on what happens with recession and also how quickly banks can offload this debt. The banks have had some success in offloading debt for Citrix and Nielsen, mm. but other debt, such as the 13 billion billion dollars for Twitter is very stuck on their balance sheet. So we'll have to see how especially economic conditions unfold. We've been talking a lot about private credit, this boom in private credit that you're seeing in that United Airlines loan. Uh, I think it was yesterday, right? Time is a circle. But yeah, what about the private equity market? Right. Yeah, you know, private so debt market. Why can't that fill the void here? So private credit is trying to fill some of that void, but it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that banks have gotten nervous, private credit lenders have also gotten nervous as mm -hmm. well. And they have pulled back on the ticket size and the amount really? of debt they've done for individual transactions. Yeah. So now if you want to do a private credit deal, you need more private credit firms to get involved. Interesting. But I mean, but the risk profile for what private credit does is a lot different than the risk profile that banks can't or can do, I shouldn't say what they're willing to do. I mean, that's a big part of the reason why we've seen that shift into private credit, right? That's correct. Yeah. So private credit firms are often willing to do riskier deals. They yeah. do charge more, but they offer what we consider a certainty of execution. There's not the volatility of right. the public debt markets when you do a private credit But now deal. you're saying that even they are maybe getting a little bit reticent. I think it's sort of yeah. twofold for them. On one hand, they're nervous, but on the other hand, it's a great chance to take away market share from the bank. So they also do want to step up from <laughs> their clients at the same time. Yeah. But it's it's complicated. Yeah, there, well, are, there are a few people in this space. I think that's their own, own only focus. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. yeah, we'll talk about that, those people who are mono-focused on this, and the, the banks, namely. I mean, we're in the thick of earnings season, at least when it comes to the banks. What does this mean for bottom lines going forward? So it means that they're nursing some losses. So they've already taken some of those losses when they sold some of the debt at a discount last year. But for the $40 billion still stuck on their balance sheets, they're also paper losses, because you have to mark to mark most of those kinds of assets. Um, but so far, the banks have not really been breaking it out in any more detail. I was looking through earnings today, and there don't seem to be any more clues, but they have definitely lost millions of dollars on these transactions. And on Twitter alone, if you just take the mark-to-market -mark paper loss, it's roughly $4 billion of losses. Yeah, I think that Twitter loan, we're going to be writing about that, I think, uh, for years to come. Uh, I am curious, though. I mean, you mentioned Citrix, and we talked a little bit, uh, I think, uh, early in the program about Tenneco and Brightspeed here. I am curious as to what this means for, I guess, new deals, the deals that, already out, that aren't already in the pipeline. Is this going to put a chill on that, do you think? It has, yes. Yeah. So when private equity firms mm. now are trying to raise debt financing to take over the next company, mm. it's harder to do that. Mm. They can go to banks, they can go to private credit, but in both cases, they're often asking for higher you know, coupons or yields, and they're asking for more protections as well. Mm. And that makes it a, a tougher proposition. So in some cases, we've seen even a few private equity firms just forget the leverage and just completely fund something with equity, which is very atypical for the private equity space.